uh, I would like to introduce um, Marcelo to the audience. Marcelo, probably most people here know Marcelo, but it's always a pleasure to uh, make sure that the, the larger audience know him better. So Mar Dr. Marcelo Bonini actually obtained his PhD from the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Paulo. It's pa Sao Paulo that you say, right? That's correct. Okay, in Brazil. So he then joined uh, Dr. Ronald Mason Laboratories at the NIHS um, for his postdoctoral training. Uh, and where he actually worked on his research focus on pharmacology, toxicology, and, and single transduction uh, affected by bio bio biological oxidations. So in 2009, he moved to the University of Illinois at Chicago as an assistant professor of medicine and pharmacology. He quickly rose to the rank of associate professor. And uh, in 2018, uh, Dr. Bonini joined the Medical College of Wisconsin at Milwaukee as a, as a professor of medicine and, and biophysics and a founding director of Innate uh, uh, Immunity Program. But I, my guess is that his passion for Chicago has been so strong that he only stayed two years in, at Milwaukee. I may be wrong, but my, that's my guess, Marcelo. And then he moved his group back to the Fenberg School of Medicine of Northwestern uh, University, where he now serves as professor of medicine and Associate Director of Education and Training at the Robert Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Bonini received multiple outstanding awards, including a Research Excellence Award by the Medical College of Wisconsin in 2019. He was named Faculty and Scholar of the Year by the Uni uh, University of Illinois System in 2017. And briefly as a postdoc, he received the Fellow Award for Research Excellence. I would I just cite a few. He has multiple other awards. Uh, Dr. Bonini actually holds multiple leadership positions, including being the Vice President of the Society for Redox Biology and Medicine uh, since 2018. He is the Chair of the FASEB Committee on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion uh, since 2020. And he is an um, uh, editorial member for multiple journals, including the Free Radical Biology and Medicine. He became recently an Associate Editor of Oncogene. Uh, Dr. Bonini's laboratory is interested in understanding how change in electro uh, or chemical balance of the nucleus alter gene expression pattern. He published over 100 articles, and I would like to highlight his recent uh, to the force uh, that actually unveiled that acetylation of SOD2 can turn SOD2 from being a mitochondrial antioxidant to the nuclear histone demethylase with multiple uh, uh, ramifications, multiple incidents on cancer stemness and EMT. This work was published this year in PNIs. So his talk today will be, uh, his, his, his talk will be entitled Mitochondrial Driven Comarin Remodeling via Eastone H2 one Oxidation, Implication for EMT and Breast Cancer Metastasis. Uh, Marcelo, welcome to the NIH uh, Redox Biology SIG. It is a pleasure to have you here and we'll love to learn about your most recent um, discovery in the lab. Thank you so much, Rubeni, uh, and thank you, um, the Special Interest Group, for giving me the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about this uh, studies that we are doing focused on how changes in the redox bio biosphere of the nucleus, the atmosphere of the nucleus, has very important implications for gene transcription. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. So uh, thank you also, Rubain, for, for mentioning this uh, research on SOD. I think that the research that I'm going to present to you today uh, evolved from the findings that the lab has been making over the several past years of, of enzymes that are redox active. And they are not necessarily uh, seen in the nucleus or the, all the time or studied in the nucleus, but we have found several of them then. They're indicating that the nucleus might be much more active in terms of redox regulation that we have thought so far. And one interesting thing is that since I was a student in Sao Paulo, I always thought of biology as this very interesting puzzle of biomolecules where life and disease happens because of this biomolecules find each other, their shapes dictate how they interact. And these interactions will then lead to uh, biological effects or, or, or health, disease, but you know, when we think about these interactions, even when we model molecules that bind to these pockets to have remedies and, and drugs, we tend to think of bio, biomolecular and biomolecular interactions, that they happen in a vacuum. We pay attention to the structure, we model the structures, but you know, in real life, 
these interactions happen in a biophysical context. And what I mean, this, this interactions happen uh, immersed in an environment where there is a pH associated with it, temperature, uh, different ionic strengths, and even the capacity to oxidize or reduce different biomolecules. Although most organisms, and, and humans in particular, are very intolerant to changes in temperature and pH, one thing that I always thought is amazing about redox is that you can have orders of magnitude changes, even within the same cell, even with uh, the same uh, uh, organ. You can have cells that are very different, very different redox states, even pockets where you have very different uh, uh, oxidation capacities or organelles that are oxidizing versus organelles that are reducing in the same cell. Uh, it's very hard also to change pH and temperature locally, but the very nature, the very hyper-local nature of redox processes, because these species are not going around very much, indicate that you can have these different redox systems, these very redox environments coexisting in the same cell. And they are very important because if you oxidize molecules, you also change the shape and you could change their interactions and their function. Uh, there are actually a number of um, examples, uh, many provided by people in this very room, that this is true for the cytosol, for instance, when mitochondria produces reactive oxygen species that are proteins such as P10 that are super sensitive to, to this uh, hydrogen peroxide or superoxide, the thiol group that is part of the uh, active site gets oxidized preferentially because of, of its low pKa. Uh, and then you have the activation of phosphorylations of, of PI3 kinase and, and AKT signaling that propagate through the cell. It's also true in the case of VHL, uh, reactive oxygen species oxidize VHL, it releases HIF1 alpha, it produces the HIF transcription factor, and when it goes to the nucleus, it might, it might find in the nucleus a completely different redox environment uh, that is probably more reducing and it finds its targets and thus transcription. Same thing with NERF2 and so many other examples uh, that we have seen coming from many groups and normally always related to the cytosol. One thing that is interesting though is when we think about reactive oxygen species and oxidations and we think about the nucleus, the first image that comes to mind is damage. It's DNA damage and now we're going to have the DNA damage response. But you know, uh, it, it's all a matter of concentration. There is signaling by reactive oxygen species in the cytosol, and there's also damage. If the reactive oxygen species are produced at high quantities, proteins get oxidized, they lose their function. And we started to think that, you know, we have to bring this vision of, of redox signaling to the nucleus now. It's not only damage. How about physiologic changes in the redox environment of the nucleus? What are the implications for the structure of the biomolecules that exist in the nucleus? Transcription factors are forming the, the, the very structure of chromatin being affected by its light oxidation. That's maybe not enough to damage, but it's enough to regulate. And what I will try to convince you of in the next few slides or so is that there is a physiological concentration of reactive oxygen species that, that modulate uh, several uh, aspects of nuclear biology. Uh, one important aspect of the nuclear redox biology that we are studying is the oxidation of histones, specifically uh, certain variants of histones. And when histones are oxidized, that's a new post-translational modification that impacts the very structure of chromatin and how uh, transcription is regulated in the nucleus. That will be actually the first uh, few slides that I'm going to show to you. Uh, that the redox regulation of histone variants by oxidation uh, is important and reflects in, in uh, transcriptome changes that regulate cancer, phenotype, cancer cell phenotypic trans, uh, tr uh, transitions. And as we come to the end of the talk, I am going to show you a real life example where we are studying the effect of pollutants, and in particular, a heavy metals, lead, cadmium, arsenic, in uh, changing uh, mitochondria, making it more, uh, more uh, capable of producing reactive oxygen species. These are all mitochondrial poisons that have been known for a very long, very long time. And that results in changes to, to transcription that promotes uh, more uh, aggressive forms of cancer vastly via this oxidative process of histones that we are going to explore in the first part of the talk. So if we are going to study uh, redox biology and, and, and effect of reactive oxygen species being produced in the nucleus, the first thing that you need to do is to be able to see them. And uh, the way that we uh, tried to get around that problem was to collaborate with Tobias, 
and get this biosensor, this ratio metric biosensor called ARP1 Rho GFP2. Uh, it's a fusion between two proteins, uh, ORP1, which is an yeast protein, and GFP, which is a fluorescent protein. And uh, depending on the oxidation state of ORP, the excitation wavelength for this biosensor changes. With the reduced form uh, being excited at 488, we're going to seal the color that green. So green means reduced. And uh, when this ORP is oxidized, it changes the conformation of the biosensor. And now it can be excited at 405. We still don't call it that red, so red means oxidized. What we do in the lab is that we convert green and red to pixels, and we mathematically calculate their ratio, expressing them into these heat maps of reactive oxygen species. Uh, the, the, uh, more, uh, the warmer colors mean more reactive oxygen species, and the colder colors less reactive oxygen species. So the first thing we did was just got a number of breast cancer cell lines. My, my lab is interested in breast cancer for a long, long time. That vary in terms of their tumorigenic and uh, aggressive potential, also metastatic potential. And we just expressed the biosensor in there just to see if aggressiveness uh, was related to changes in, in, in the levels of reactive oxygen species that this protein that, that the cells sustain in the nucleus. Uh, the degree of mitochondrial dysfunction is also known to be different in cells. So we wanted to see if there, there were differences in, in the nuclear uh, redox environment of these different cells and if correlated with aggressiveness. And that was the first nice surprise that we, we got. We saw that mcf 10 cells, that's the closest that you can get from a normal memory epithelial cells. The cells are not tumorigenic. If you place them in a mouse, they don't grow tumors. And you see that the levels of reactive oxygen species in the nucleus chronically are very low. MCF7s are tumorigenic, but they never metastasize. They are, you know, the garden variety of breast cancer. Uh, they, the, 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 the uh, cells will grow tumors in mice, but you never get them to actually metastasize. You see that there are elevated levels of uh, reactive oxygen species in the nucleus. The nucleus is slightly more oxidizing. But as you go to these phenotypes that are, that are very invasive, that are very aggressive, that are metastatic, you will start to see the accumulation of a lot more uh, oxidants in the nucleus. One interesting thing is that when you transform these uh, mcf 10 cells by expressing inducible VSARC, uh, it's a process that leads to very metastatic, very malignant cells within the space of a week. You see that now the malignant phenotype, the metastatic phenotype, also has very high levels of reactive oxygen species sustained in the nucleus. So these nuclei exist at a more oxidizing state. But what does that mean? What having a more oxidizing nucleus mean? So to be able to study the function of or, or, or the biological goals of this more oxidizing nucleus, we had to have a system that allows us uh, to uh, generate reactive oxygen species in the nucleus. And we resorted to this invention by Belozov, the D-amino acid oxidase. We just fused it with the CMIC nuclear localization sequence and made a uh, system that now can generate reactive oxygen species, in particular hydrogen peroxide, in the nucleus of the cells where it's expressed. So what you see here is the same mcf 10 cells now uh, expressing NLS-DAO uh, in the nucleus. When we treat with d -alanine, you see that we can elevate the reactive oxygen species in this organelle. We titrated it to make sure that there was no DNA damage uh, that we could measure and that these levels of hydrogen peroxide were confined to the nucleus. I'm not gonna go through all the controls. They are available. Uh, the paper is actually submitted to a uh, bioarchive so we can go through the very details of every single experiment. And here is just the control with hydrogen peroxide. You see that the sensor responds. So when we uh, submit this uh, mcf 10 cells to a pulse of hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus and do an RNA-seq analysis to find what processes were most uh, up or down regulated, we found that there was a relatively rapid and transient elevation of genes that are related to epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Very, very clear uh, markers of epithelial to mesenchymal transition of the high dehydrogenase, SOX9, uh, PAL2, F3 is actually OCT4 and a stem cell gene, and several others that are related to the maintenance of the epithelial phenotype or the transition uh, to a mesenchymal phenotype. Uh, 24 hours after this pulse of reactive oxygen species of hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus, most of the transcriptome went back 
uh, to baseline, except for a few genes that remained upregulated. And of course, when we did the geo analysis of the RNA seq results, we found that processes that are that are um, inherent to uh, phenotypic commitment were changed. Uh, for instance, epithelial cell differentiation, response to wounding, which is very associated, very linked to epithelial tumor zinc node transition, and of course, regulation of cell adhesion. Uh, cells that are transitioning to a more mesenchymal phenotype, they tend to be less adhesive. And this is just uh, the gene uh, uh, set enrichment analysis. Again, you see that a lot of these EMT genes are upregulated. But you know why these genes were being upregulated? So we started to think that if you change the redox environment of the nucleus, you have to impact chromatin structure somehow. And maybe by impacting chromatin structure, we would be able to see that the promoters of these genes that are regulating T would be more accessible. And we just did a nuclease assay uh, to determine if this, these promoters were more accessible. We actually focused on a few no mediators of epithelial to mesenchymal transition, including SOX9, ZEB1, NANOG, and TWIST. Some of these showed up in our RNA seq studies. And what you see here is that rapidly after we initiate the production of hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus, these promoters become more open, more accessible for transcription, uh, all of them basically. And you see that while some uh, are, are open in a sustained manner, such, such as NANOG and even ZEB1, others tend to respond transiently to hydrogen peroxide and then uh, go back to baseline that also uh, was represented in the RNA-6 studies. Uh, at around this time, there was a beautiful paper that was published by the Blenis group. Uh, Ana Gomez was the, the first author of this study, and she now has her lab at the Moffitt uh, Cancer Center in Florida. And she showed that for epithelial uh, to mesenchymal transition to happen in response to cytokines like TGF-beta and TNF-alpha, you needed to change histone variants. Uh, you lose histone uh, 3.1, it's a variant, uh, that uh, maintains heterochromatin, maintains genes silenced, and those uh, histones are replaced by uh, H3.3, which is a different variant that now opens chromatin and opens regions where active transcription should happen. So having found that a, a lot of these genes that hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus is changing are related to EMT, and with this finding by Anna in mind, we decided to, to ask whether we were losing uh, histone 3.1 uh, because of hydrogen peroxide being produced in the nucleus, and if it also had an impact on 3.3. And the result of the experiment is here. We again uh, subjected MCF 10A cells to a pulse of hydrogen peroxide generated by the chemogenic system. You see uh, the Western blot analysis shows a time um, course dependent loss of 3.1. Uh, 3.3 seemed not to be affected. But what you actually see in the end is that you alter the ratio 3.1, 3.3 with an increase uh, uh, in chromatin openness. That's what happens when you lose uh, histone 3.1. We also used a strategy, uh, almost a, a negative control. We express catalase in the nucleus. So uh, when catalase is in the nucleus, it will uh, quench hydrogen peroxide and detoxify it very, very quickly. So that's the, the say that you're seeing here, uh, cells that have an LS catalase, you cannot upregulate hydrogen peroxide there. And when you have catalase, you see that this effect of losing 3.1 is no longer there. So it is hydrogen peroxide dependent. And the consequence is that you lose 3.1. You see that 3.3 is not affected. It's not, it, it's a oxidation resistant histone in comparison to 3.1. And then I started thinking, what's special about histone 3.1? Why it's redox sensitive and 3.3 is not? So what we found out, if you look at the sequence of these two uh, variants, 3.1 has a cysteine res residue on position 96 that is changed to a serine in 3.3. And while serine is uh, not uh, redox sensitive, cysteine is redox sensitive, and there's lots of examples of redox regulation that happens because thiols are oxidized by hydrogen peroxide. So the next experiment that we did, and I know that it's a busy slide, I'm gonna walk you to each component of it, is that we mutated uh, cysteine 
uh, 96 per serine. And then we repeated our experiment where we pulsed hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus. And once again, you see that when you do that in cells that express the wild type at uh, 3.1, you lose 3.1. But uh, the mutant that expresses serine is much less affected by hydrogen peroxide. How that impacts the accessibility of those genes that I showed you were responding to hydrogen peroxide and becoming more accessible because they were exposed to hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus. So here is SOX9, ZAB1, fibronectin. I'm just going to talk about one. It's true for the others. So you see that in cells that express uh, histone 3.1 wild type, when we uh, stimulate with the alanine and produce hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus, there is an increase in accessibility of this promoter. But when we express uh, the mutant that does not have that cysteine, a hydrogen peroxide cannot make the promoter of SOX9 more accessible. Same is true for the other genes that we looked at. Uh, you see, uh, this is a cheap PCR assay, so it measures the association of these promoters with these histones. Again, if a promoter is associated with 3.1, the gene is possibly, it's probably silenced. If it's associating with 3.3, it's uh, being activated. So I'm just going to uh, talk about these three columns over here. Uh, what happens is that we treated cells with hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus. You see that the promoter of SOX9 was less associated with uh, histone 3.1 and more associated with 3.3, indicating the activation uh, the, uh, the, that the, 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 of this gene that this promoter is now more accessible. Now, if you express the mutant uh, 3.1 without that cysteine, there is no reduction in the association of the promoter with histone 3.1 indicated that there's no effect in the transcriptional regulation of this gene by hydrogen peroxide unless you have that cysteine in that position. And of course, if you look uh, at the outcome, uh, looking at the protein levels uh, in response to hydrogen peroxide, the cells that express 3.1 wild type, you see there is an upregulation in the expression of SOX9, ZEB1, but in the cells that express the mutant, you don't see that effect of hydrogen peroxide going along with the more uh, structural assays that I talked to you before. And now, of course, talking to Doug Spitz at the University of Iowa, he said, well, but you have to show where these reactive oxygen species are coming from. And we said, well, you know, there is a candidate there. We think that a lot of these reactive oxygen species are coming from mitochondria. We had worked with this, these systems before, and we actually had seen that. So the experiment that you were seeing is just the transformation of MCF10A cells from the benign uh, non-tumorigenic phenotype to the mesenchymal uh, aggressive phenotype. As we have seen before, we saw an increase in reactive oxygen species being produced in mitochondria. That's with the mitoorp rho GFP2 biosensor. And you see that when uh, the cells transform, there's an increase in, in mitochondria reactive oxygen species that also reflects into an increase in reactive oxygen species in the nucleus. However, when we express mitochondrial targeted catalase, catalase will now intercept hydrogen peroxide in mitochondria. You see that the levels of reactive oxygen species in mitochondria are reduced, and that reflects into a reduction of reactive oxygen species also in the nucleus, indicating that the source of the majority of these reactive oxygen species, hydrogen peroxide, that the nucleus is experiencing as the cells are transforming uh, is coming from mitochondria. And an important experiment was, of course, what happens with histone 3.1 if we now express mitochondrial targeted catalase and induce transformation. So what you see here is that uh, cells that are transformed, uh, they lose 3.1 because of this hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus. If you treat with the alanine, they also lose it because hydrogen peroxide drives uh, the oxidation and loss of 3.1. But now, if you try to transform the cells that express mitochondrial catalase, you see that 3.1 is preserved. So we don't see uh, such an impact in the EMT markers, and, and there's no uh, uh, EMT in the cells that are expressing a mitochondrial catalase, indicating that this uh, production of reactive oxygen species by mitochondria that end up doing regulatory functions in transcription of EMT genes in the nucleus is important for the EMT process. So the next question really was, you know, uh, how here, what histone pool is being affected? Is the histone 3.1 pool that is not bound to chromatin? 
So we are actually starving the nucleus of 3.1, or is the bound histone that is already incorporated in the nucleosomes that we are affecting with hydrogen peroxide being produced in the nucleus? So one way to look at that is that, uh, as, you, as some of you might know, uh, histone 3.1 is only it's cell cycle dependent. It's attached to cell cycle. 3.3 is not. It's cell cycle independent. It's being made all the time uh, through the life of the cell. But 3.1 is only made during the S phase. So while DNA is being duplicated, 3.1 is being produced. So the, the nascent DNA can be wrapped around this histone 3.1 and the nucleosomes can assemble. After three point, uh, uh, the, the uh, S phase is completed, uh, the remainder of 3.1 that is not part of nucleosomes is rapidly degraded. So you should not have unbound 3.1 at any other point of the cell cycle other than the S phase. So we actually uh, transfected some cells with this FUSHI uh, indicator. FUSHI is a cell cycle indicator. It has a geminin, which is a SG2M uh, protein uh, conjugated with GFP. So cells that are in these phases of the cell cycle will have green nuclei. Uh, once they transition to G1, that's going to be CD21 conjugated with RFP, red fluorescent protein. So the nuclear, uh, the nucleus will appear red. And of course, if the cells are not committed uh, into the cell cycle, they will have no color because they don't have either CD21 or geminin. We synchronize the cells and we then select them in G1 or in uh, SG2M, and here is the results from the G1, not to make things more confusing than they need be. So at this phase of the cell cycle, as I mentioned to you, all of the histone 3.1 is incorporated. So when you give a pulse of hydrogen peroxide, you see that you lose uh, 3.1 from the nucleus. And if we uh, uh, incubate the cells with MG132, that's a proteasome inhibitor, before we shock the nucleus with hydrogen peroxide, we can preserve 3.1. This is the quantification down here. Uh, you lose incorporated 3.1 with hydrogen peroxide and you protect it with um, MG132. And of course, we decided to look that what this indicates that hydrogen peroxide then is, is evicting 3.1 from nucleosomes. And you should see an impact on heterochromatin dissolving because 3.1 is important to mark heterochromatin sites. So if you look at the uh, nucleus, this is electron microscopy, and you can actually see heterochromatin. It's indicated by these arrows over here. It's this denser, darker regions. You see that there's a lot of that going on in nuclei of control cells. But after you shock the nucleus with hydrogen peroxide produced by the chemogenic system, heterochromatin now dissolves. And you see that the nucleus even swells a little bit because now it has to accommodate a more expanded chromatin. The quantification of this assay is right uh, here. You see that you actually lose heterochromatin and you are increasing a little bit the area of the nucleus. And wh what does that mean for the biology of the cancer cell? So what, what do we believe that it means is that now by expanding the, the, the accessible chromatin using redox processes to do that, Cells have access to many more transcriptional programs and transcription combinations than they would have uh, in a more restricted uh, state where heterochromatin is stabilized. And that allows cells to explore plasticity programs, chemoresistance programs, and even uh, assume uh, more plastic uh, phenotypic um, characteristics. And we tested this in uh, two experiments that I'm gonna show to you next. So here what you're seeing is PY230 cells. Those are murine uh, memory uh, cancer cells. Uh, and what we did is that we treated the cells with doxorubicin, which is a very toxic chemotherapeutic agent. Uh, what you see along these slides are different drugs or a different phenotype of these cells. I'm gonna be talking about these uh, quadrant. Everything else is pretty much essentially the same. So day one, the cells are not being treated with uh, doxorubicin yet. You see that the vast majority of the cells have very low levels of nuclear ROS. Uh, they are proliferating. You can see it here. When we add doxorubicin, though, as expected, the vast majority of the cells died. Uh, although there was a residual down here of cells that didn't die, that's pretty much what chemotherapy or most chemotherapy uh, um, 
regimens do to the clinic. The bulk of the tumor cells die, but then you have some remnants one. And by day six, after a short period of drug-induced dormancy, these uh, cancer cells started to proliferate again in true persistence. That means the drug is there. They couldn't care less. They were just proliferating. And when we looked at the reactive oxygen species in the nucleus of the cells, they were actually very elevated. So either these persister cells can elevate the levels of hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus, or these chemotherapeutic um, uh, agents are selecting for cells that have high nuclear loss and can maintain uh, reset and maintain proliferation in the presence of the drug. You see that the, the, the cells kept proliferating uh, while they have their nuclear loss elevated. Uh, we had transfected in a inducible nuclear catalase construct, so it could turn known catalase in the nucleus at any point of this experiment. And when we did that at day eight, you see that as reactive oxygen species collapse in the nucleus, cells become, again, resensitized to the chemotherapeutic agent, almost indicating that you need to maintain a more plastic nucleus that is also more oxidizing to be able to adapt to treatment, and once you restrict the cells, the capacity of the cells of maintaining that state, they now can no longer survive chemotherapy. It's true also for Paxotaxel. It's another first-line chemotherapeutic for breast cancer, and it's also true when you use PY8119, which is another murine uh, memory tumor cell line. If that's true, then we we should think that if uh, ablating this capacity to elevate uh, reactive oxygen species in the nucleus should also have an impact in the tumorigenicity of the cells. So what we did here, again, we used the MCF-10-8 model. We uh, either uh, expressing nuclear catalase or not. Just to refresh your mind, uh, hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus down regulates 3.1, then catalase prevents that. And when we use this, uh, we transform MCF-10-8 cells and inject in the memory fat pad of mice, you see that the, the, the cells that do not express nuclear catalase produce very metastatic tumors. Uh, uh, you can see it here, uh, tumors that also grow pretty rapidly. But cells that do express catalase in the nucleus, you see that they cannot produce tumors when injected into the mice. And the few mice that actually uh, had any tumors, the tumors would grow much slower. So at this point, we decided to do a really crazy, really bold version of this experiment. Like, can the, 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 the suppression of nuclear ROS also impact stage four metastatic disease? So that's the experiment that we did next. So for this experiment, we just changed a little bit the design of the, the, the previous slide. And what we did is that we transformed MCF-10 cells into that very metastatic um, uh, phenotype we injected into the memory fat pad here, and we left the tumor there for a few months. As you see, the tumors grew uh, very aggressively. Now you have clear metastatic spreading in the mice three months after this. Uh, after this image, we now turned on catalase, and you see that the metastatic disease pretty much went away uh, in the ones, I'm sorry, that we turned on nuclear catalase, but continued to progress in the mice that we were not treating. One interesting thing that we find, though, is that the primary tumor couldn't care less about catalase in the nucleus, and that let us think, why is that? So what we think, the, the, the hypothesis that we are addressing right now, is that this plasticity, this, this, this hydrogen peroxide, this, this redox um, endowed plasticity is required for, for cells to live in different microenvironments. Let's say if you're a memory cancer cell, you're not supposed to be living in the brain, the bone. Those are very different microenvironments. So to be able to withstand living in those microenvironments, the cells need to sustain a more plastic phenotype. If you remove that by suppressing hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus, they cannot do that. They cannot sustain that. So metastatic lesions are sensitive to uh, this uh, removal of hydrogen peroxide from the nucleus. But primary cells, uh, the, the, the cells that are living in their, in their organ of origin, they are less dependent of this plasticity. At this point, we also decided to test a different idea that combining traditional chemotherapy with removing hydrogen peroxide would affect the primary tumor. And the results that you're seeing here indicate that it does. Uh, so we are developing now uh, catalase mimetics that go to the nucleus and combining with traditional chemotherapy to treat stage four tumors. This is just the quantification of the data that you see here. 
you see that in the mice that are not treated, tumors keep developing. When you turn on catalase, you see that there is an inversion of the tumor development. It's largely because now we don't see the, metastas, the metastatic lesions anymore. And if you change the quantification, what's above the diaphragm metastasis and what's below primary tumor, you see that it's really the metastatic lesions that are, that are very much affected by the removal of hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus. So to conclude the first part of the talk, um, of course, uh, what we are proposing is that there is a novel uh, signaling axis that connects changes to the metabolism to epigenetic regulation. And that's hydrogen peroxide that, that is produced in mitochondria that oxidizes histones in uh, the nucleus, and that leads to, to promoting structural changes that regulate the transcriptome. And by trans uh, regulating the transcriptome, it also impacts disease progression, sensitivity to treatment, and everything else. And of course, I cannot uh, not mention uh, Ana Gomez, who was, whose work, brilliant work, by the way, was a major inspiration for, for the study that we did in the Redox biology world. And as I promised, I'm just going to show a few uh, uh, pieces of data indicating that uh, pollution, and particularly heavy metals, can induce uh, these, this phenomena that we are studying in, in terms of meta metabolism-driven chromatin reprogramming and have an impact in EMT. It's very, very much known that transition metals, particularly lead, uh, cadmium, arsenic, they have this, this potency in inducing EMT. So we decided to look if the processes that we were studying, mitochondrial-driven chromatin remodeling, could be involved in that. And that's a very different idea because normally uh, labs in the field of toxicology tend to look at these compounds as primary carcinogens. We know that a lot of them are primary carcinogens, arsenic is a typical example. But we are much more interested in understanding if these metals are phenotype drivers. What do I mean by that? So a woman has an ERPR, breast cancer, treatable, curable, normally not a problem. But she happens to live in a very polluted area, socioeconomic disparities, uh, environmental health injustice, and she gets exposed to these metals. Will she have a different response to treatment? Will she have a poorer outcome because these metals are changing the phenotype of the primary tumor? So that's what we want to look at. What you see here is just uh, MCF7 cells now, the ER, PR positive cell line incubated with different metals, uh, whether that is lead or arsenic or cadmium, or even a mixture of lead and cadmium. And what you see is that you quickly lose progesterone receptor. Uh, that's prognostically important because that means that a luminal A tumor that is much more treatable is now becoming luminal B, which is much more difficult to treat. Uh, there's also acquisition of mesenchymal markers. And that's very similar to what happens with the GF beta which is a classical EMT inducer and a molecule that has been shown by Anna to require the histone uh, exchange to trigger EMT. Not only in terms of their petri dish behavior, but cells that are exposed to these metals uh, over a prolonged period of time and then inject into mice, they become metastatic. So remember that I told you that MCF7 cells are not metastatic, and this is your mouse uh, injected with MCF7. Three months after the injection, you see that they don't have any tumors. Uh, however, if you uh, if you incubate this uh, MCF7 cells with arsenic for 300 days, that is what it means, 100 nanomolar for 300 days, low level, very prolonged exposure to simulate what people encounter in real life, you see that now you have phenotypes that are heavily metastatic, uh, all the mice developing metastatic lesions after uh, three months. From injection, that's also true for lead. Uh, uh, you see the results here, control and lead treated cells. So next, we decided to go back to resort to our, to our model system. Is that because uh, mitochondria is now poison and it's producing reactive oxygen species and these reactive oxygen species are getting to the nucleus and histones are being exchanged and all that. So what you see here is MCF7 cells that do express the uh, nuclear localized uh, biosensor incubated with lead, arsenic, cadmium, and the mixtures uh, that, I, that I mentioned. You see that uh, it's, it is heterogeneous, but cells start to have accumulation of uh, reactive oxygen species in the nucleus, particularly the lead and arsenic and cadmium and arsenic mixtures seem to synergize to produce that effect. 
Uh, this is a quantification of individual nuclei. So you see that there's not only an increase, but an increase in heterogeneity, which is really interesting. Uh, hetero phenotypic heterogeneity is a problem uh, in the clinic for, for cancers. Uh, it's hard to treat heterogeneous disease. Uh, and what you see that happens here is that uh, hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus, as we are seeing happening here, does regulate a progesterone receptor. This is just the cells that express the chemogenic system. Now, if you shock them with hydrogen peroxide, you see the loss of progesterone receptor, just like the metals do, uh, loss of fecal during and gain of fermenting. If you incubate the cells with arsenic, you see that also. But if you express nuclear catalase, now you can prevent uh, uh, arsenic-driven uh, driven, uh, EMT, indicating that a major mechanism by which arsenic and the other metals are induced EMT is via uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, flowing to the nucleus. This was a very interesting experiment that we did to follow on that observation. This is a, a single cell RNA-seq of MCF7 cells. They tend uh, to uh, group in clusters that have very epithelial characteristics. Uh, some of the markers uh, are shown down here. Uh, Areg is a uh, typical mesenchymal marker. It's very low in control. It's high in the uh, arsenic plus lead treated group. Uh, you see that when you treat cells with arsenic and lead, you almost lose the cells in this epithelial clusters. And now you get these mesenchymal clusters down here um, that are characterized by high Areg, uh, lower Icadirin, and lower uh, progesterone receptor. However, in the cells that express nuclear catalase, you almost completely restore the epithelial phenotype. So indicating how important this, this, this meta metabolism, hydrogen peroxide driven remodeling of chromatin is for EMT, whether it happens in response to cytokines, whether it happens in response to metabolic decline, or whether it happens because of mitochondrial poisons. Uh, here we see uh, that, again, uh, if you treat uh, the cells with either arsenic or lead, you see that you lose estrogen receptor, you lose its function because progesterone receptor is also downregulated, ecadirin is downregulated, you get mesenchymal markers, but now if you express NLS catalase as you bring those nuclear reactive oxygen species levels down, particularly hydrogen peroxide, that's what catalase quenches, you also reverse the EMT phenotype, and the cells become more epithelial. So does that result in better outcomes for, uh, for, for cancers that have been exposed to metals? So this is, again, that experiment that you guys have seen already. Uh, we just got control cells. We exposed the cells to arsenic, and uh, we inject them into the mice. Three months later, we come back, and now we have very metastatic uh, carcinogenic phenotypes emerging from these typically no metastatic cells. It's shown right here. However, if you have catalase in the nucleus, arsenic is no longer able to transform those cells. And what you see is a bunch of happy mice that do not have tumors later on. So I think that what I, I would like to tell this, this audience is that, you know, for a long, long time, we have looked at reactive oxygen species as damaging species. You know the literature from the 60s, 70s, 80s, where ROS is always damaging. And then in the 90s and 2000s, there was this explosion of redox signaling that we looked happening in the, in the cytosol, many, many examples. However, we still have that mentality when we think about the nucleus. We, we, ROS in the nucleus, DNA damage, right? And what these, these experiments, this collection of experiments are starting to indicate is that there's a lot of signaling, physiological um, signaling that is happening in the nuclear space. Of course, that the oxidation of histones is one example, is the example that I think is, is more mature from, from our lab. But there, there may be many other processes that, that reactive uh, intermediates are, are influencing the nucleus. Uh, the formation of different transcriptional complexes, uh, the, the interaction of these transcription process, uh, complexes with DNA, whose structure can be changed by oxidation. We looked at histones, but we haven't looked at DNA yet. Maybe oxidation of RNA, and that will change. Although you have a transcriptome that looks similar, your, your proteome is, is going to look very different because maybe ox uh, uh, RNAs that are oxidized while they are being translated will have different functions, will have different consequences 
uh, when it goes to the cell. So I really hope that that, that I will you know, have more colleagues interested in looking at these processes in the nucleus, because I think it's, it's a new frontier uh, for our field that, that really promises um, to be interesting and, and probably very useful. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, uh, the, the, the village that it took uh, to uh, move this project forward. Uh, I'm not going to go one by one, but here you see the people and what they contribute in terms of expertise. I put the disciplines that I have expertise on down here. Uh, it's really a multidisciplinary group. I have to, uh, to thank uh, NIH, without which none of this would be possible. Uh, and of course, all of you for your, for your attention, uh, wishing you a very happy uh, holiday season moving forward. And of course, I'm going to be uh, happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, for a fabulous talk. Uh, it's uh, extraordinary. I, I will, I will actually to uh, ask the audience to put in the question in the chat, if you wish, or you can just simply turn on your microphone and ask directly the question to, to Marcelo. Quick question that I have, um, I don't want to take time. Uh, when you look at the activation of SOX promoter, uh, when you look at the incorporation of H3-1 out the SOX-9 promoter, do you think if this parallel over active chromatin mark like H3K9 acetylation, H3K27 acetylation, what happened to those active chromatin mark? It is, it is an awesome question. So what, the, the way that this whole study started is because we thought that different writers and different erasers, because they're different proteins, would be differentially sensitive to hydrogen peroxide. So we actually started looking at acetylation with, uh, and, and, and methylation when we were losing a lot of these marks. And, and then that's when Flavio came to me, uh, Flavio Palma, and said, you know, I think we might be losing the whole thing. It's not acetylation, not methylation. We're actually losing histone. And that's when we started to block for histone three. We saw that we had a, a lower levels of histone three. And then we went uh, to look at the variants. And then we were surprised to see that H2.1 was more affected and the whole story came after. We did analyze the epiproteome. Uh, there are many changes. Uh, I don't know what happens with the promoter of SOX9 specifically, but there are some marks that are more sensitive than others. Uh, if you, um, my opinion is that uh, probably those are marks that are related to the variant. For instance, uh, H3.1 is enriched in, in, K, uh, in K9 uh, trimethylation. Uh, it's also enriched in K27 trimethylation. So I think that the loss of the histone uh, could explain a little bit some of the changes in the epiproteome, but I, I don't remember specifically which, to which promoter we saw higher or lower uh, changes. We do have mass spec analysis of the modifications and I would be happy to collaborate with anybody interested to see uh, if there's an impact on writers, erasers, um, happy to do that. Thank you. So quick question for Mike uh, SP. Does the change in chromatin st structure organization create a more permi permissive fit forward for nuclear H2 to signaling? I think so, Mike. We are working with Vadim Bachman, so thank you for the introduction many years ago, <laughs> to do chromatin tomography and look at uh, if there are domains that are more sensitive than others. So what uh, we are seeing is that the opening of chromatin that is regulated by hydrogen peroxide promotes a diversification of transcriptomes. I think that is really an ancient survival mechanism. I think that, you know, if you're a little bacteria and you are under stress and you have to survive, so you wanted to make all of your genome accessible so you can explore different combinations of gene expression that will uh, give you advantage to survive, that perpetuates the species. I think that cancer cells learn to do the same thing. So if you put them on chemotherapy, radiation therapy, what happens is that mitochondria may be damaged, produces reactive oxygen species, make the, the, the genomic landscape more accessible. You saw that with the EM images. And now the cells can explore a much wider variety of genomic programs uh, that will result in different transcriptomes. Uh, uh, if you look at the population wide and, and now cells can survive and adapt. So I think that's what's happening. So uh, there are changes in, in chromatin structure. We have the EM data. We are obtaining now the, the chrome stem data, which I think will be much more informative. Thank you. Question from Carola uh, Newman. Um, how does expressing 
uh, nuclear catalysts affect cell division and cycle? Great question. It slows it down. So one thing that uh, we uh, transiently, like immediately it slows it down, but then cells adapt to it. So one thing that we, we also observed, and I'm not talking about this because this, this aspect of the work is not mature enough. Uh, when we give these very low levels of hydrogen peroxide to the nucleus, we expected because of all the thinking about DNA damage and cell cycle arrest, that cells would proliferate slower. But what we saw is that we saw an acceleration of proliferation, particularly with MCF7 cells and T47D cells that are breast cancer cells that have the karyotype preserved. Um, that was very strange and very surprising. And then we, uh, we started working with catalase. One, one reason why we uh, did the inducible catalase is that at the beginning, the cells where we express NLS catalase proliferate so slowly that uh, it was hard to have enough cells to do a bunch of experiments. So we went to the inducible uh, uh, promoter. And that also enabled this, this more elegant experiments where you can have the cells producing reactive oxygen species in the nucleus, et cetera. And when you turn uh, the, the uh, uh, NLS catalase on, you see this collapse in proliferation and you see this collapse in the ability to survive uh, chemotherapy. So the, the answer is, uh, immediately uh, there is a, a slowdown of cell cycle. Another question from Brock. Brock, I will ask just one of your questions so that I give a chance to more uh, people too. So question from Brock, uh, does ROS level correlate with breast cancer subtype? What, what the data suggests is that it does, but you know, I would be very careful to make that assumption. For instance, MCF7 cells are your classic luminal A. They are ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative. Uh, BT20 and BT474 are more of the luminal B type. There is a little bit more aggressive. Um, they do not typically express PR, but they are HER2 negative or positive, depending on which one we're talking about. And they are ER positive. And MB221s are your model of triple negative. And you see that as you go from luminal A to luminal B to triple negative, in the slide that I showed you, there is that it seems to have to, to it seems that there is a correlation, but I looked at one or two cell lines from each subtype. So I would be very, very uh, careful to, to make that statement. Quick question from Clovis Palmer, multiple questions, but I, I will ask one here, which is what impact could the probe that you use have on inducing metabolic stress by themselves? Um, can you repeat that? So okay. the probe that you use to quantify the ROS, the nuclear ROS, can this probe? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, metabolism? yeah. Well, uh, yeah, right. If you, if you, the, the problem is a little bit like the, the, the Schrodinger's cat, right? Uh, if you illuminate, you put the cat in a box. If you don't open the box, you don't know if the cat's dead or alive. Um, it's a little bit the same problem. We have to be able to see the reactive oxygen species, but when uh, you put these probes there, and hydrogen peroxide is, oxidizes them, uh, you quenched a little bit of the hydrogen peroxide that should be um, doing its physiological function. Uh, however, I think that that's why we do uh, controls with catalase. The, the hydrogen peroxide will oxidize histone 3.1, probably other thiols in the nucleus, and the sensor in a competition reaction. And the thiols are kind of competing at the same rate. When we express catalase in the nucleus, catalase is by far more uh, efficient in quenching hydrogen peroxide. I think the rate constant is 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9, mol to minus 1, second to minus 1. And then you really eliminate hydrogen peroxide. So that's how you can ascribe the effects that you're seeing to hydrogen peroxide. Of course, in the case of this particular study, we also did the point mutation of that cysteine. So we know that you know, it's a hydrogen peroxide cysteine independent process, so you don't have any choices what's going on. It's probably being oxidized. But yeah, there's always the potential that the probe will interfere with what you're measuring. But you know, I think that the counter arguments that you don't have the probe, you can't measure it. Sounds good. Question from my colleague, uh, Travis Strucker from, uh, here from NCI. Is the oxidized H3-1 um, removed, that is removed and presumably degraded chaperoned prior to degradation, especially a canonical chaperone protein involved in degrading um, H3-1. 
of oxygen. We do have oxygen. some information. So again, a, an aspect of the work that is not mature enough, but we did look, if you look at Ana Gomez's paper, she also looked at, at several chaperones. She looked at Chef One, Dax, I believe, and she looked at Hira. So at the time, I think that now we think a little bit different about these processes, but, but Hira was the chaperone for 3.3 and uh, Shaf 1, which is a multi-component complex, was the chaperone for 3.1. What we see is that there are components of Shaf 1 that are downregulated by hydrogen peroxide, namely Shaf 1A and Shaf 1B. So that should not only, um, what I think is happening is that hydrogen peroxide in the nucleus is not only removing 3.1, but also making it more difficult for 2.1 to be reincorporated because of the downregulation of these chaperones. And what we saw is that HERA is not affected by hydrogen peroxide, so almost indicating that you preserve the capacity to uh, incorporate 3.3, which you know, the field, I believe, is now, is now thinking it's a, it's a gap filler uh, histone. So when you lose your, your proper histone component, uh, H3.2 has this gap filling uh, activity that in the case of the cells is important for EMT. Question from, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't resist jumping in with uh, a minor comment, but first I want to thank you for a beautiful presentation, important research. I, the, the, the minor comment uh, is prompted by the fact that you're a native Brazilian and a, another native Brazilian in my laboratory, Natalia Rocco Machado, has recently published a paper that relates to your first slide in which uh, you showed a uh, oxidative modification, a very well accepted one of, of uh, CAMK2. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Signing oxidation. Well, what Natalia has shown in collaboration with, with Mark Anderson is that the methionine is not oxidized. That's an error. And she's shown that, in fact, uh, it is an oxidation, but it's a disulfide formation in the regulatory region. Right. Uh, thank you for the comment. I, you know, I think. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. You know, it's it's actually. <laughs> let's see how it fares. But it's the alternative uh, um, section, the, the the alternative approaches section of the grant that I'm submitting on this. Uh, we think. I think. That uh, and that's why I want more people studying this because there will be a host of modifications. Well, I'm talking about oxidation. How about nitrization? How about glutathiolation? How about you know all of the host of the the modifications that the 1696 can suffer, other than oxidation? That that's what I'm studying now. And in terms of methionine, I would love to talk to you a little bit further because I think that the methionine sulfoxide will also have a regulatory role in transcription. That is a little bit harder to study because you know methionine sulfoxide the reagents are harder, but you know there might be ways uh, to look at that. I think that um, methionine sulfoxide oxidation is another one that could be. And interestingly, three point two, you know, that are that are three point one and three point two are not distinguishable with antibodies. Uh, the three point three and three point one slash three point two are, but uh, three point two has methionines that no other three point one or three point three have and i think that you know there might there might be functions related to that it's just that 2.2 is well, a lot I'd less known love to talk with you more about that uh, absolutely <laughs> love to follow up marcelo is that the uh, histone that's oxidized and diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma to methionine i think it's the it's mutated Right. Yes. Uh, in pediatric uh yes uh there is there is a methionine that is absent but i think that what and and I'll be careful here because I, I don't know much about that. I think that what happens is that the mutation of the methionine prevents acetylation of a, res a residue. Of that the is by. Exactly. So it's not a direct, uh, uh, you know, methionine modification issue is that the mutation of that methionine uh, does not allow the writer, I believe, to add that acetyl group there or remove the methyl. It, it, you know, the writer or the eraser cannot approach that site. So I think that's it, what the... It could be redox regulated to oh, uh, yeah. that chromatin structure. Absolutely. And I think that probably, you know, for something like the, the pediatric lioma, I think there is enough indication that the mutation 
is what drives it because of that acetylation. But I think that for, you know, phenotype diversification of cancers and, you know, uh, some aspects of transformation or the activation of certain components of carcinogenesis, the oxidation of methylene will play a role. Absolutely. Great. I, I, will, I will hopefully, do you have time quickly, Marcelo, to ask a few more questions? Of course, I'm so, here for so you guys. question from Jessic um, Zilonka. Sorry if I apologize if I mispronounced the name. Does nuclear catalyst affect cytosolic and or mitochondrial H2, H2 to level? Yashek, uh, well, first, hi, Yashek. Yashek was a, a former colleague from MCW. Thank you for the question. Um, judging from the mito orc, no, because, you know, um, if we uh, treat the cells with rotenone or we treat the cells with antimycin and they have nuclear catalase, we see they behave in the same way. If we put mitochondrial catalase in there, you see a difference. But of course, you know, I think that to give you a 100% answer to that, I would have to do other studies. What I can tell you is that to, to determine that the hydrogen peroxide we were producing was actually nuclear, we measured a bunch of proteins that are known to be redox regulated in the cytosol. And what we saw is that, you know, at this level of hydrogen peroxide production, 10 nanomolar of diala with NLS diala, we don't see a loss of P10, we don't see activation of AKT, we don't see activation of AMPK, we don't see activation of P38. So, you know, uh, it, it seems that hydrogen peroxide is staying in the nucleus. In terms of NLS catalase expression, we did fractionate, uh, and this catalase is tagged. It is not in any other uh, region of the cell, mitochondria, cytosol. Uh, it was exclusive in the nucleus. So I would think not, but, um, you know, I, I, can, I can't exclude the possibility that in a situation where you have a lot of hydrogen peroxide diffusing all through the cell, if you have an LS catalase in the nucleus, it would act as a sink of part of that. But, but I think that's a different study. I, we, we definitely, have not encountered those levels of hydrogen peroxide that that diffuse to the cytosol and outside of the cell. Quick question from Cody before I can, uh, previous you can turn on microphone and, and ask your question or uh, quickly after Cody, how would you identify, question from Cody, how would you identify that a condition generating H2O2, nuclear H2O2 did not damage DNA, did not cause DNA damage? No, we did several studies. So we did the comet assay, we did uh, 8 ox ODG, we um, uh, studied activation of the DDR, uh, the DNA damage response. And at those levels of hydrogen peroxide that we're using, 10 nanomolar of DIALA combined with the AO, uh, we are not seeing increasing in 8 ox ODG, we are not seeing increase in the comet assay, we are not seeing increase in double strain breaks, and we are not seeing ATM activation or the activation of other. Uh, proteins involved in the DDR. So that's why I'm thinking that if there is damage, it's minimal, and it's so minimal that it's not activating the DNA damage response. But, you know, obviously, I can't exclude that in, 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 in 100%. It, it, the levels we're using are not activating the DDR. That's what I can tell you. Sounds good. Travis, you want to go? Sure. Thanks for the interesting talk, Marcella. Um, my question was, the, um, the tumors you're generating with arsenic and lead, have you actually sequenced those to see whether you have a mutagenic signature consistent with oxidative damage? Because I'm wondering how, you can, how much you can tease apart you know, DNA damage-induced mutations and gain of function versus the signaling generated by ROS generation. Brilliant suggestion. We have not, but I think we have to. Brilliant suggestion. So my, my conclusion that these, um, the nuclear rods is driving a lot of this is based on this data that you saw, that we can prevent EMT, that we can, but I think that particularly in the in, in real life scenario, when we're going to start to look at patients that might have been exposed, uh, the mutation signatures will be absolutely critical. Thank you for that. Great, thank you. And I think Mike, um, Mike uh, SP has the last question. Mike can go, can you go? So Mike said, how do cell control peroxy peroxysome as a sink related to directing nuclear H2O2? I don't know, my friend, actually. To, to, to be honest, I don't know. Another question that I think we should address, you know, if people are interested in, in, in these topics. But I, what I can tell is that there are a few papers that came um, along in 2022 by Desai and Campanella. It's an Italian group. 
uh, in Science Advances, and another paper by Evangelos Michelakis last year, where they showed, the first paper shows that mitochondria in the nucleus are tethered. Uh, in, and that's important because NF kappa B stability in the nucleus, according to the Science Advances paper, is maintained because hydrogen peroxide produced in mitochondria is actually inflowing into the nucleus and maintaining NF kappa B stable there. So that would be a mechanism where the flow is controlled by tethers, by channels, you know, by TSPO, which is the protein that stabilizes these channels. Uh, Evangelos actually says that pieces of mitochondria transfer to the nucleus. He's exploring that in the context of acetyl-CoA being produced in the nucleus for epigenetic regulation. I think it's a cell metabolism or, or some cell family journal paper published last year. But, you know, you could think if, if mitochondria transfer pieces of itself to the nucleus, and you have dysfunctional, dysfunctional, I don't think it's functional. I think it's a very intentional program based on this data. But, you know, if dysfunctional, quote unquote, mitochondria transfers dysfunctional mitochondrial pieces into the nucleus, you could think that that's another way that you can elevate reactive oxygen species in the nucleus using mitochondrial derived materials. True, false, I don't know. I think that there's a lot to do there. Sounds good. I think we will stop here. And uh, I would like to thank everyone for, for attending. Happy holidays. And thank you so much, uh, Marcelo, for uh, accepting to present. It is a fabulous. I mean, you could see that this is fabulous. And I'm sure that the conversation will continue with you probably by email and, and other conference. Thank you so much. Very welcome. Thank you guys for the invitation and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye bye.